Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Friday VMR. Uh, we're very, very lucky to have two very special things today. One is Prof Rez in a suit. Uh, Prof Rez is taking time out of a very busy day. He's actually uh, in Oklahoma uh, visiting an institution, but did not compromise on RLR and is uh, here with us today. Uh, you'll hear from him in a second because he's going to uh, take on Aliquot 1. I also wanted to uh, put the spotlight on one of our newest team members, Hui Tang, who's presenting her first uh, case on VMR. And it's exciting because uh, of that, but also exciting because it's the first case that we'll have um, that has gone through our case review committee. Um, and so really, really excited to see all those things. Um, uh, and... Um, yeah, without further ado, Hu Ting, take Robbie, it away. who's playing games with the reporting button? I have no idea. I, ha I have absolutely <laughs> no idea. Um, I, I agree, though, that I should stop babbling is, I think, the fundamental message. And I should pass the mic to Hu Ting to say yeah. hello, introduce yourself, tell us about your doggies, uh -huh. um, and then jump right in, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ravi. Yes, it, this is actually my formal first case presentation. So I've been uh, in this team helping with scribing, teaching points, but I wanted to do a case presentation. Uh, but I was, um, I don't know, I, I, I think I was a little bit anxious as well. Uh, and then um, we created this uh, case review committee, which is great. Um, we have so many team members who, uh, who want to help everyone who wants to present a case. So I really encourage anyone from uh, uh, who is joining today uh, to consider to uh, present a case. And if you want to, we have a great team member uh, to help you through uh, your journey, and uh, I'm very excited. And I want to actually uh, sh uh, to give a big shout out to Leah and Joseph, who uh, they were uh, the one who helped me uh, to do some uh, suggestion and edit to this case uh, presentation to make it smoother for everyone. Uh, so yes, uh, so please, uh, if you want to uh, present a case, please send us an email to the clinic, uh, to the clinical problem solver at uh, gmail.com or just join our social media. So yes, we welcome everyone. So now uh, with the case presentation, uh, I'm going to start with the chip complaint. Okay. Uh, so this is a 52 years old uh, male presenting with severe neck pain. Should I stop or do you want me to give a little bit more information? Well, first of all, welcome, welcome, welcome. Honestly, whatever you'd like to do, you let us know. You are running the show, my friend. Okay. So yes, actually, um, yes, it, it's a very simple ch uh, chip complaint, but I wanted to see your what are your thoughts, like your initial you thoughts. Got, you got it. You got it. So maybe I'll just tackle this before the next aliquot. And I want to um, applaud everyone in CP Solvers for having this really clever idea of having cases reviewed so everyone can present. And thank you for being the first presenter. So when it comes to neck pain, truthfully, I take an anatomical approach and I just imagine an arrow going through the neck and what structures might be affected that can cause pain uh, to be sensed by the patient. And before I even put the arrow through the neck, in all comers, neck pain is probably explained by muscle strain. It's not as common as lower back pain, but I'm sure everyone in the audience has slept awkwardly from time to time, whether it's one pillow, two pillows, and they woke up with what is neck pain? So the question becomes, when should you be concerned about neck pain? And we'll, and I think that's actually a better question to answer than putting an arrow through the neck. I think the red flags is if you have severe pain that is persistent. Here I'm using analogical reasoning with lower back pain. If you have severe pain that's persistent and that does not go away with NSAIDs, Tylenol, that's a reason to be concerned. If you have neck pain and a focal neurologic deficit, like you can imagine if the vessels involved um, 
you know, you have a dissection of the vertebral artery, the carotid artery that then manifest into neurologic dysfunction. That's a red flag. If you have neck pain and fever, could the bone be involved? That's a red flag. So what I'd like the audience to do is to just think about an arrow going through the neck from the skin and soft tissue, going a little further to involve the fascia, the muscle, the bone, and the nerves and the vessels. And so if you have neck pain plus, neurologic deficit, neck pain plus fever, neck pain plus headache, neck pain that's persistent and not responding, those are reasons to be concerned. The focus is the neck, but you have to realize that there can be referred pain from other parts of the body, but really the focus should be that, that region. Back to you, my friend. Yeah, that was great. Actually, that was a great first thought. Um, I'm going to give you more information about this patient. So going for the uh, HPI, this patient presents with exacerbation of his chronic neck pain after receiving a cervical epidural steroid injection one month prior. There was no immediate complication post-injection. Uh, three weeks after the injection, he re-experienced the severe neck pain associated with weakness in his bilateral upper extremities. I'm gonna go a little bit more. I'm gonna give you some review system. Uh, he, uh, some, this is some uh, positive findings. Uh, he referred intermittent subjective uh, fevers for the last couple of weeks but doesn't check his temperature. His wife noticed him having a persistent dry cough that has been ongoing for months. Uh, he denied subtle anesthesia, bowel of, or bladder incontinence, or extremity uh, paresthesia. He denied um, night sweat or unexplained weight loss. He denied hemoptysis, pruritic chest pain, and shortness of breath. Do you want more? Ting, I think you've given us a lot of information to play around with here. And I will say that what just happened is uh, there are two big red flags. First is that the patient is receiving a treatment that has comes with some risks. And while the majority of patients with epidural steroid injections do just fine, it's hard not to worry about the small number of patients who get complications, which mainly are infections around uh, the injection site. However, there's not there's not um, that that isn't the only concerning feature. The other concerning feature is this person now might have neck pain, not just as neck pain, but neck pain in the context of a systemic disease that appears to be involving the lung. And not just neck pain that is a systemic disease involving the lung, but also the neck pain that has now appears to have a complication with uh, associated subjective weakness. So all of a sudden, what has happened between the neck pain and now? If we try to be systematic and just fill out our columns of background and foreground, the background now is a 52-year-old man with a history of cervical DJD with epidural steroids. And the foreground is worsening neck pain, subjective fevers, subjective weakness, and cough. And the problem is that everything except the neck pain is still subjective. The fevers are subjective, the weakness hasn't been demonstrated on exam, and the, fe and the fever hasn't been documented. So this could totally be that the fevers, the cough, the weakness are actually no uh, distractions and noise, but the most concerning symptoms, when the most concerning hypothesis would represent this as a systemic disease from with neck pain and concern for associated compressive effects on the spine. But in reality, we haven't proven any of those. So I'd, I'd maintain an open mind. But I'll pass the mic to Prof Rez to see what he's doing with this information. As he finds the mute button. I, I, yeah. um, I am just uh, very impressed and I'd love the case to continue to unfold. I have nothing to add. Excellent job, Ravi. We think you're crushing it. Keep it coming, my friend. Thank you. Well, for the next aliqua, I'm gonna give you a little bit about his past medical history. So this patient has a recurrent left chest abscesses starting five years ago, following trauma at work 
and recurs almost yearly. Also have hyperlipidemia, chronic back pain. Uh, and regarding to his past surgical history, he has a C7 to T4 laminectomy with hardware two months ago, multiple incision and drainage for left chest abscesses with the most recent four months ago. Uh, AD, um, ACDF, which is anterior, stand for anterior cervical discectomy and fusion at cervical C6-7 with hardware 18 years ago. Uh, medication, he's taking rosubastatin, gabapentin, oxycodone, uh, no pertinent uh, family history, uh, social history. He is married and monogamous for 10 years. Uh, work in construction, doing large-scale demolition and paving. Because of work, he travels mostly in the Midwest and South US. And health-related uh, behaviors, he smoked one pack uh, per day with 40 pack year history and marijuana occasionally. No alcohol or IV drug use no military services, no farm or animal exposure. I'm going to just leave you here before I go to physical exam. <laughs> What are your thoughts? Sorry, everyone. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm doing all this on my phone because I don't think, uh, oh, I shouldn't make a joke about this because it's being recorded. But anyways, I'm doing all this on my phone and it's hard to find all the data. But I will um, just start discussing some thoughts here and then pass the mic to Robbie. And I can't read the whiteboard because it's on my phone. It's very small. But I'll just comment on the things that stood out to me. One is that if we're being authentic to the process, there's no reason that at this point construction work, even though I know Shema gave us the eyes, the googly eyes, it shouldn't really bias you in your clinical reasoning. You have to be authentic to the case as it unfolds. And I think what's quite shocking here is the fact that this patient has had recurrent lung abscesses. Is that correct? With, yes, recurrent lung abscesses. That in itself is really, really odd. So it makes me have two immediate thoughts. One thought is that um, these abscesses, I would want to know that those diagnoses have been verified. How, and what I mean by that, I imagine that someone did some form of imaging and it showed maybe a cavitary lesion with an air fluid level and the patient got diagnosed with an abscess. And then you would be interested in knowing um, what were they um, given and how did they respond to treatment? If you step back for a second and ask the question, why do people develop lung abscesses? Oftentimes it's due to aspiration. So from the bacteria in the oral cavity, anaerobic and, and gram-positive organisms that they aspirate, then they form a cavitary lesion with air fluid level. Then you put the patient on augmentin, covering strep and anaerobic organisms, and they typically do well. And it's usually people with like poor dentition or an increased risk of lung abscesses. But you have to pause for a second and ask the question, are there mimickers of lung abscesses? And the answer to that question is absolutely. You just go to our cavitary um, lung lesion schema that's online and you'll see some mimickers. So step number one is, are these truly abscesses or are we being fooled? And the only way to answer that is to see what treatments were done to the patient? How did they respond? Oftentimes you don't need to biopsy these. You try to get sputum, you may not get a diagnosis there, but you give an impaired trial of augmentin and see how they respond. If these were really like recurrent abscesses, then you have to ask the question, what is this patient's immune system? Do they have any compromising condition that's leading them or making them vulnerable to recurrent infections from common variable immunity, like hereditary stuff to acquired stuff like HIV. So I think that's gonna be really important. I'm not gonna comment on this patient being in the South or the Midwest, because ultimately all of us are in one geographic location. So we don't need to use that to make progress just yet. Now, if we get imaging, 
And it heightens our concern for cavitary lung lesion with osteomyelitis or epidural abscess, then of course we'll step back and we'll use the construction work and the geographic locations to maybe consider something like a fungal or endemic mycosis, but it's too early for that. So bottom line at this aliquot, I'm a bit perplexed by the recurrent lung abscesses. I don't know if they, I wanna know if they really were abscesses or if it's a mimicker of lung abscesses. Robbie John, anything to add, my friend? Oh, Nada, I think that's superb. Um, I can't, I can't wait to, to uh, understand clearly what's going on now, what's happening in the neck, what's happening in the lungs um, to be able to make progress. Thank you. Take it away, Hu Ting. Yeah, sure. Um, this is a really good reflection about uh, the patient past medical history. And uh, I think there's a question about the chest abscesses. Uh, it doesn't really ex specify if it's, um, it just said that they have some drainage of, of the chest abscesses, but no more information about that. I'm sorry that I cannot really answer the question from the chat, uh, but that is the information that I have. Um, but I'm going to uh, go for the next aliqua, which is a physical exam. Uh, so this uh, patient, uh, his vital sign uh, temperature is 36.4, heart rate 67, uh, BP 131 over 79, uh, respiratory rate 20, and SpO2 94% on room air. Uh, his uh, exam, he uh, general is well developed, well nourished, and no acute distress, non toxic, uh, lying in bed comfortably. But when he tried to move for exam maneuver, he appears in significant pain from the, his neck. Um, he's H E E N T, no mass or deformity, uh, cardiovascular, regular sinus rhythm, S1 normal, S2 normal, no murmur, rubs, or gallop. Uh, his pulmonary exam is normal respiratory effort, uh, decreased air movement within the right upper low region. Uh, clear to auscultation throughout the other lung fields, no wheezing, rail, or ronchi, no increased work of breathing. And everything else, uh, abdomen, neural, uh, extremity, and skin, it looks within normal limit. This is profoundly astute, Hu Ting. I think that the, now there's confirmation of lung involvement, not because of uh, the exam, honestly, because decreased air movement within the right upper lobe is so nonspecific and maybe the result of atelectasis. But when coupled with the presence of a SAT of 94% in this gentleman who has no cardiac reason to be hypoxemic, now the case is a very strong one for the presence of a lung neck syndrome. And a lung neck syndrome is probably best thought of as either metastatic lung disease to the neck or a metastatic pulmonary infection to the neck. So this could occur in many, in many ways. Either the infectious process is a regular old bacteria like Staph aureus or Strep pneumo that has caused cervical osteomyelitis. However, the time course here on the order of weeks is most, com most compatible with a granulomatous disease process or a filamentous disease process. But of course, um, cancer is in the, in, in, the, uh, in the background, not just because uh, of the time course, but also because of the patient smoking. So I think the most effective way forward is through one simple test, and that's a CT uh, with contrast of the chest. Why with contrast? The value of being able to study the inflammatory reaction in the lung, um, whether it has spilled over into the pleura and caused an empyema, um, whether, uh, and to see if there is lymphadenopathy in the mediastinum is going to be very, very uh, informative. And the good news is that that's probably the only test you need um, right now for um, the possibility that there is disease in the thoracic spine. Um, and I think it would be really, really important to also consider CT of the, of the cervical spine while you are taking this patient. So you can essentially with CT C-spine and CT chest, the CT chest will allow you to visualize the thoracic spine very, very well. And so now I think the, the, the interesting question will be, are his abscesses in the thorax, be it in the lung or on the surface, are they related? They don't seem to be overtly related right now because they're, they're on the other side, on the left side, compared to the right upper lobe infiltrate. 
but this person could have occult left-sided disease that wasn't appreciated on exam. And so it's become very clear that I think the you will make a tremendous um, amount of progress by understanding the radiographic imprint on the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, and the lungs of this disease. And it'll be very, very informative. But the labs may help you understand the radiology if the patient has profound neutrophilic leukocytosis or thrombocytosis, I really, really help coalesce the case. But I think the most productive next step will be to take a picture. Prof Rez, any thoughts before we get more data? No, I'm just smiling for the picture, my friend. <laughs> All right, Hutink, tell us more. Yes. Uh, yeah, great. Um, yeah, great thought. Uh, it's true. Yeah, we need some imaging, but I'm going to start uh, giving you some of the lab. And we have some CVC. Uh, white blood cell is 10.1 uh, with absolute neutrophil count of 7.27. Lymphocyte count uh, 2.32. Hemoglobin is 13. Platelet 483,000. Uh, BMP, we have sodium 136, uh, potassium uh, 4.8, chloride 100, bicarbonate 29, BON is 9, creatinine 0.6, uh, glucose 114. And I have some additional lab. We have some hepatic function panel, a AST 42, ALT 44, total bilirubin 0.5, Alkaline phosphate is 126. T protein, total protein is 8. Albumin is 4. We have uh, ESR uh, 67, and the reference normal is 0 to uh, 15. Uh, CRP 6.1, normal is less than 1. Uh, lactic acid 1.11, uh, A1C 6. And I have the CT chest. Uh, so it shows acute right lower low pulmonary artery embolism, uh, multifocal bilateral pulmonary consolidations, which may represent a combination of atelectasis and pneumonia. Any thought? <laughs> that, that is fantastic. I think um, this is really interesting. So what I take from all the labs, is that this patient is inflamed. And you have to remember that this ESR and CRP are not specific to any type of inflammatory disorder, but are non-specific markers of inflammation. And I think um, it's so interesting that the absence of fever, it's really important to note that that does not rule out inflammation. When you look at this platelet count, it's actually really helpful because it's elevated, which is another marker of inflammation, but not any type of inflammation. This inflammation goes back to what Robbie said, is that it's a subacute to chronic process as opposed to an acute process like DIC, where you usually have a drop in the platelet. It just helps you with prioritizing types of infections. So I think with this additional data, when you think about infections and um, subacute inflammation, it's not your typical causes of bacteremia, but rather atypical organ organisms. Some of them Robbie mentioned, like filamentous, like actinonocardia, or non-bacterial infectious organisms, specifically endemic mycoses. Very briefly, could this be cancer? It could be, but the thing that makes cancer less likely, usually solid organ cancers, like if those consolidations represent alveolar metastatic disease to the lung, they don't usually have a, a significant inflammatory flavor to them. Unlike lymphoma, a lymphoma usually has a thrombocytopenia, a liquid cancer. So here, Robbie, really what I am thinking gets prioritized is probably an infectious etiology. I think the pulmonary emboli is because the patient's inflamed and is hypercoagulable. And now I'm using analogical reasoning. I have to go fact check this later. But patients who have pyelonephritis end up with vertebral osteomyelitis because there's a plexus, a vein, a vein, a vein drainage system known as Bastone's plexus. So if you have pylo, or if you have prostate cancer, it shares a similar venous plexus. So then you're at risk of lumbar 
spread of disease. I wonder if the lung is right here and this patient's having cervical pain, could whatever infection is being here through some form of plexus, like venous plexus, end up spreading to the cervical spine? So it's in this patient, it's clear that um, they're gonna need the spinal imaging. And in this patient, it's a patient where you wanna ask the question, can you make a diagnosis without invasive testing? Here, invasive testing, which is not really that invasive, would be a BAL with lavage to really sample the fluid in the lung, send it for cytology, gram stain culture, and, and other forms of um, stains for atypical infections. Or can you send some serologic and urine studies like urine histo, urine blasto, coxy uh, serology, fungal markers to try to make progress in the diagnosis? I don't, I don't feel you have to rush to give this patient antibiotics because it's subacute. They're not severely septic. But what I would want to do is image the spine. And then I would probably go to sample the lungs, start with the sputum. You can do induced sputum, but maybe this patient's going to need a BAL to really try to identify the organism. And someone like this, the travel history is important. If there's any concern that this doesn't sound like TB based on the uh, distribution, but if there were concern, you would have to isolate them in a negative pressure room as you're uh, further evaluating them. Robbie, what, what additional thoughts do you have, my friend? I have zero additional thoughts, my friend. I think you're absolutely spot on. I'm, and I think um, it's true that you were kind of surprised by the fact that this patient has a pulmonary embolism. And I think the surprise comes from the fact that this the symptom complex of a pulmonary embolism is likely overshadowed and sucked into the more dominant um, syndrome of neck pain. And we talked about this at yesterday's VMR about the idea of distraction phenomena. Yesterday, Prof. Rez, we had a patient who had a stroke and couldn't talk and had aphasia, just like Aaron's case. And he couldn't tell us that he had had um, probably had severe chest pain resulting in an MI resulting in LV thrombus that had embolized and caused a stroke. And I think that this patient here with the amount of neck pain he has, he's not gonna notice the small amount of pain that he might've had with his PE. And it just is very, very humbling. But I agree with you. I think that the syndrome is too dominantly inflammatory for the PE to give us any real guidance. And I think a surprise PE without inflammation should make you think cancer, but PE in the context of his symptoms, the symptoms are stronger than the pulmonary embolism. And so I think I'll just share one, a very unlikely possibility, but whenever you're thinking infection and pulmonary embolism, for a second, you should think about the fact that the infection may be in the venous system. And so here in the context of the patient having neck pain and a pulmonary embolism, do you wonder, hey, does this person have involvement of the internal jugular, the IJ? Does this person have septic thrombophilitis? But the reason that hypothesis is much less likely is because usually those patients have unilateral neck pain. This patient is not localizing their neck pain. So I thought of that and then immediately put it um, lower down on the list because of where this patient's neck pain is. And I think the question on my mind, Prof Rez, I'll summarize because I just noticed a few people joined now. I'll summarize. We have a 52-year-old man who has chronic neck pain, got cervical epidural injection in the neck pain, in the neck, presents with uh, subjective fevers, signs of inflammation, worsening neck pain, as well as pulmonary findings characterized by consolidations and a pulmonary embolism. And Prof. Rez is guiding us through really entertaining the idea of unusual atypical infections. And the parallel question that I'm trying to ask Prof. Rez is, how can we prioritize that DDX based on the fact that this person is apparently immunocompetent? And so I guess the first part is, is he really immunocompetent? What is his HIV? What is his um, CVID? So on and so forth. But if he truly is immunocompetent, how can somebody who is only 52 get a disseminated tuberculosis or an endemic mycosis? And the pearl there is of all those infections, the one that is most likely to affect an immunocompetent host and do this, the one that is most likely is blastomycosis. So I think that um, I don't remember what the epidemiology was of this person, but now I'm curious. Um, and and I, uh, I, yeah, I don't remember. I, I don't remember where he traveled, but now I would revisit that information. But it doesn't change our empiric thinking. It uh, we need to do the BAL and the fungal serologies at Prof. Rez, but let's track that. Is this person actually immunocompetent or not? 
Hey, Robbie, I'm so sorry. My internet kicked off. What was the one organism you said for the immunocompetent? You left, you know, you left me like wanting to know. Oh my gosh. Prof. Rez, you know, this is like the case we just had on RLR. I don't know if it's the one organism, but it's the most likely to occur in immunocompetent. It would be blasto. Like most people who have disseminated blasto, um, a lot of people are immunocompetent. In stark contrast to TB, where you find either age as an immunocompromise, in stark contrast to um, histo, in star many conditions. Like this person is- Can I just say, Wee Ting, that's awesome. Wee Ting has a very good poker face. She's not, not I mean, when you said blast out, just think if there's any change in the eyes, a smile or something. She's not giving anything away today, my friend. <laughs> Alrighty, take it away, my friend. Yes. Oh my God. Thank you. Wow. This is this is a real clinical reason, and it's great to see everything. I mean, all the thought that you both have, and because we're running out of time, I'm just gonna type in. Um, I have a lot of um a negative lab, so I'm just gonna type in here in the lab so everybody can see. And um, yeah, um, I think, uh, Ravi, you asked about epidemiolo epidemiology of this patient, and he, he was traveling a lot to the Midwest and South of the US, if that answers your question, because of work. Uh, here, so, um, so beside all the lab that I, um, that I type in, everything was negative, including blood culture, influenza, Legionella, all the uh, respiratory virus panel is negative. HIV is negative, uh, serum 1,3, beta, D, glucan assay is negative as well. UN histo and blasto is negative as well. Uh, spinal fluid for crypto is antigen is negative, HIV negative, hepatitis B and C negative, immunoglobulin with the normal limit. He also had a MRI complete of the spine uh, with and without contrast. Uh, posterior epidural collection measuring five millimeter in thickness from T3 to T5 that could represent abscess. And how I still have a final information that's gonna help to narrow the diagnosis. So I'm gonna, because we're running out of time, so I'm gonna give you that um, information. So a wound culture from the epidural abscess, what's sent, and a wound culture grew no cardia. And, and that's the last piece of information I have. <laughs> Robbie, <laughs> I'm struggling here. You should always hope that I'm on my phone. I'll give you more opportunity to chat. I just want to make one quick comment and then pass you the mic, my friend. And the comment I want to yeah. make here is that um, the MRI we think was the right study to perform because the patient had weakness. So we were worried about potential myelopathy or pathology of the spinal cord, which is not detected on CT scan. So with weakness, the MRI, you could always start with the CT, but you got to get that MRI. And then the last pro I'll share before passing the mic to Robbie is when you have contiguous involvement of the vertebra, meaning that there's something spreading through the vertebra. I know here it's an abscess prioritizing infection, but because the disc, the intervertebral disc space is avascular, cancers usually don't spread contiguously. So that's another uh, clue that you're dealing with an infection. Of course, we saw an abscess here, but I'm gonna pass the mic to, to Robbie. And the one thing, I know the chat was really high on tuberculosis, but remember that um, TB has cousins. And the cousins include histo, nocardia, and actino, uh, meaning these partially acid fast uh, positive um, organisms. But Robbie was spot on. We were dealing with a long bone clinical syndrome. Robbie, what are your thoughts? Like, are you surprised that this patient has um, nocardia? Prof Rez, you know, our dear Shema called it. And she said, hey, remember, no cardiac can occur in immunocompetent patients, which is superb. <laughs> what organism did you say? I said blasto. So you should always listen oh, to okay. Next week's RLR is going to be RLS because I'm out. I'm fired. <laughs> uh, I think that um, I think. It, this is such an educational case, and I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised this nocardia because I actually don't know much about nocardia going to the bone. It definitely goes to the brain a lot, so I'll have to read about that and plug that gap in my knowledge. Um, and I think it, it goes to show you um, 
it goes to show you how tough these cases are. And ultimately, it's a guessing game until you get the... Nobody will ever empirically treat a patient for any of these infections without some sort of confirmation. It just goes to show you that you're just doing an educated guess. And I only think the only thing you can be confident about is, or semi-confident about is, is it a typical organism like staph strep or is it atypical? And then within atypical, it's either filamentous, granulomatous, or endemic mycoses, like one of those three things and epidemiology. And then as Shema reminded us, the host, this person being relatively immunocompetent would certainly be in line with nocardia. I'll just show out. A, I'll just throw out a very rare possibility, which I'm struck by, but probably not happening. This person is that patients um, can with no car, with disseminated nocardia can have underlying pulmonary alveolar protonotus or PAP, which might explain the fact that this patient has multifocal bilateral consolidative opacities. Uh, I say that because my understanding of nocardia is it tends to be. Um, more cavitary and more localized. So there's two possibilities. Either I need to read more about nocardia, or this patient might actually have a condition associated with disseminated nocardia, which is uh, pulmonary alveolar prognosis, which he's the right uh, right age for. Um, yeah, I incredibly educational case, um, starting with neck pain to realizing that the actual problem was the cough and not, not so much the neck. And the steroid injection was just completely a, a complete distractor. Any final thoughts, Prof. Rez? I know you have to go. No, that was awesome. Thank you. Have a great talk, okay? You think, what were your reflections on putting this case together, reading about it, and presenting it? Let, enlighten us, please. Yes, I mean, I was actually, um, the reason why I picked this case is because it started with the chief complaint on neck pain, and then it's like, the diagnosis was completely different. Like it's something that I wasn't even imagining. Uh, so in this case, I think uh, we also we we need to really consider about a patient past medical history. For example, in this case, he have a uh, a steroid injection which make him immunocompromised. But it's like a small detail that maybe we don't uh, we don't stick in our mind. And then we have um, the patient who. Um, uh, his uh his work as well so every time we have to keep this like little pieces here and there to you know to know the diagnosis the final diagnosis so yes i thought it was a very uh interesting and in how this um this case turned out to be no cardiosis i was thinking more about something neurological but yes, um, and yeah, I think um, the final um, uh, teaching point is that we need to also understand some of the uh, opportunistic infection that can come out with a patient. In in this case, it's actually not immunocom immunocompromised, but he have this uh, past history of a steroid uh, treatment. So we needed to take into in consideration. Uh, and yes, and actually, the, I have uh, the patient outcome. He had, he had um, the management. So he uh, received first Bactrim, which is the, the treatment of choice for nocardia. Uh, but he had a Steven Johnson reaction after receiving. So he, uh, he was started on imipenin and ninesolid. So he was discharged in a stable condition home uh, with IV imipenin and oral linesolid, uh, BID. So it was a happy ending. <laughs> An amazing case, so well presented. I'm sure you've inspired other people to give it a shot, just given how well you did with that with uh, such a really, really presented, well-presented case. And Prof. Rise is right. Your poker face is very, very impressive. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I encourage everyone to try it. Um, and we have an amazing team. So if you want to present the case, this is a safe place and you learn so much. So yeah, thank you so much for everybody for participating. So I think I now have to uh, pass the mic to Ibrahim for the teaching point. Ibrahim, I made you the host because I, <laughs> I have to go meet um, with somebody. So uh, I will look forward to listening on your, to your teaching points on YouTube. If you don't mind, because now you're in charge, just uh, end the meeting so that the recording doesn't capture your room while you're doing your own thing. Sure, <laughs> sure. sure. Yeah. Well, bye. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So um, uh, for the teaching points for this uh, session, I think we went through a lot. 
Uh, we discussed neck pain, history of abscess, lung neck syndrome. Uh, we also went through the imaging and the labs that would clue us more into the diagnosis. And we finally had a couple of teaching points related to the overall presentation and diagnosis that this patient had. Um, so if a patient presents to your clinic with neck pain, um, you have to think first uh, before everything else about muscle strain, um, but also do not rule out referred pain from, something, from somewhere else. Um, and then you need to go through the anatomical approach after you ruled out uh, muscle strain. And through the anatomical approach, you need to think about fascia, muscle, bones, and vessels. Um, after you do that, you also have to keep in mind the red flags for someone that might present with neck pain, and those include severe persistent pain that isn't relieved by analgesics, uh, whether NSAIDs or uh, paracetamol. Um, you also need to think about focal neurological deficits, just like this patient, um, and also think about fever. Um, and then also if a patient such as ours presents to you with uh, neck pain following an epidural abscess, um, uh, sorry, following an epidural, uh, you need to think about infections, even though they are uh, kind of rare within this setting. Um, and always think about distractions if a patient is presenting with neurological abscess, uh, neurological deficits. Um, so for example, if a patient presents to your clinic and they tell you that they have neurological deficits, but nothing else, um, you need to think that they're most probably thinking about the neurological deficits and their mind is oriented towards this problem. Uh, but most likely they also have other problems that they haven't focused on yet. Uh, for the history of abscess for this patient, uh, you need to confirm recurrent abscesses via pr prior imaging, as well as response to treatment. And you also need to consider mimickers. And if these abscesses are recurrent, um, you, should have, you should always consider immunological status first, if this patient is immunocompetent or if they're immunocompromised because different infections occur in different immunological statuses. Um, and then for a patient who is presenting with lung abscesses as well as neck pain, uh, you have to consider lung neck syndrome. Um, and this is usually related to two different differentials. Either it's a metastatic infection that had started from the lung and moved into the neck, or it's something that had, uh, or, or if it's something um, such as, for example, a uh, an infection that had just started from the neck and is moving uh, uh, to the lung, or vice versa, um, and this could be via venous plexuses, via the internal jugular vein. Uh, but however, these patients usually will present unilaterally. Um, however, you have to to keep it in your mind as well. Um, and then the reason for how, why you would consider this lung neck syndrome is because these patients can also have osteomyelitis on presentation. Um, and this is usually via old bacteria that had started within the lung and has now moved on to the neck. And then if this patient is presenting chronically, um, you also have to think about atypical organisms, um, including granulomatous infections, inflammatous, um, but also think about cancerous processes. Um, and then, for the imaging that you would do for such a patient who is presenting with uh, neck as well as lung involvement, you have to start with a CT chest with contrast. Um, the contrast is going to allow you for empyema or mediastinal lymphadenopathy close observation, and you could also consider CT spine. And then for the labs, they're going to further confirm your diagnosis um, that you're going to see through the imaging. Uh, the labs may show you elevated CRP or ESR, but those are non-specific markers. However, the high platelets are going to make you think more about inflammation. Um, and then if the patient is presenting with subacute inflammation, um, you should start thinking about, again about non-bacterial atypical infections. Um, and then also keep on the differential lymphoma since it can also present with subacute inflammation. Um, you could also consider BAL with lavage. Um, can start with induced sputum uh, if, if, BAL, if BAL is not readily available. And then you need to go for serological studies as well. If a patient is presenting with PE upon imaging, um, with this subacute inflammation, think that that PE had started secondary to the inflammation and not a primary PE. And then if they're immunocompetent, again, touching back on our earlier point, think about plastomycosis as well as nocardia. Um, and then for nocardia specifically, it can cause cavitary lesions, but can also cause uh, proteinosis, um, which, can which can explain the recurrent abscess presentation. So thank you all for being here today.
Uh, thank you, Hui Ting, and thank you to Professor Rez, and thank you to Rabbi Hadbrook. So see you tomorrow, hopefully.